Good evening, church family. It is great to be here, and as always, it's so great to see everyone out this Wednesday evening, midweek Bible study, and so very thankful for the presence of all who chose to come out and be a part of this study this week. And so we want to uh, have a word of prayer before we get into our Bible class this evening, and uh, I'm going to ask Brother Randall if he would to come and lead us in a prayer, and then we will we will go ahead and we'll get started in our class. Shall we pray together? Our Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for this day that you've given us with all the many countless blessings that you bestow on us each day. We thank you for the opportunity we have this evening to come together to study from your word. We pray your blessings upon those that are sick, uh, wherever they may be, we ask that you would bless them. And we thank you for those that, that are better, that are able to be out, and those of our number that are able to be with us. We're saddened at this time, of course, because of the loss of Sister Kendrick. And we pray your richest blessings on all her family. And we thank you for the the good Christian influence that she and Brother Kendrick had here so many, many years. We ask that you would bless this nation that our leadership might seek your wisdom in governing. And we thank you for the opportunity again of being here we ask your blessings on David as he presents the lesson tonight. And we pray that you would continue to go with us and be with us. And we ask that you would grant us all more love for each other and that you would grant us more wisdom that we might do our best to live for you. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I appreciate Brother Randall so much for that beautiful prayer he led us in. Revelation chapter 13 is where, oh, chapter 13, I'm going back in time. Chapter 17 is where we are, and we have spent quite some time on this chapter, a very good chapter. It's talking about the great harlot, which is none other than Rome herself. It's talking about the Roman Empire, and it's talking about uh, her defeat in essence. And what we have done so far in this chapter, in verses 1 through 6, we've looked at Rome described. In verses 7 through 12, we've looked at her defined. And then we concluded last week, right in the middle of talking about Rome being defeated, in verses 13 through 18. If you remember in verse 13, there the writer John says, These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. The word these there is referencing right back to those ten kings that are made mention of earlier, the ten horns that represented the ten kings. And these kings are going right back to verse 2 to the kings that joined in with the Roman Empire. And the Bible says these were of or these were of one mind. In other words, they're you think of one mind, there's the idea of unity there. That, that's what Rome wanted. Rome was this superpower. They had conquered every kingdom that had stood against them except for the Corinthians. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to gain more and more power. So naturally what they're doing is they're trying to join forces with these different kingdoms and they're promising them that if you will join with us, then you will be able to join in with our luxury. You'll be able to join in with our wealth. And in joining in with their luxury and joining in with their wealth, they also joined in with their wickedness because they too, in joining in with them, would have been guilty of idolatry, which was something that was very common in Rome. And so 
these join with the beast. Verse 14, we saw that these made war with none other than the Lamb. And the Lamb, as we've seen throughout the book of Revelation, is Jesus Christ. So they make war against the, the Lamb. And this is something that was already hinted to back in chapter 16. But here you can see that they are making war with the Lamb. But what's going to happen? The Lamb will overcome. And there is the key word in the book of Revelation. It's the word which means victory. These are going to join in battle against the Lord, but what's going to be the outcome? They are going to lose. The Lord is going to overcome them. The Lord is going to win the battle. And we might ask ourselves the question, why? And the writer tells us, because He is Lord of lords, and He is King of kings. He is the superior sovereign power, and there is no one who can stand against God and be victorious. There has never been a nation that has stood against God and was victorious. Never will there ever be a nation that will stand against God. There's never been an individual who could stand against God and be victorious. Never will there ever be one. And so you've got these people who are making the Roman Empire. They're making war with the Lamb. The Lamb overcomes. But it's not just the Lamb that overcomes. Look at what it says, brothers and sisters. It says, and those who are with Him. Who are those who are with Him? This was to the Christians of that day. Remember that this is not just a letter to tell them of the outcome of Rome, but it's also to tell them of the victory of God's people. And the victory was not just to the Lord, but those who were with Him, and they are identified as the called, the chosen, and the faithful. And we saw last week that that's none other than God's faithful people. And so victory was promised to God's faithful people back then. What's the lesson for us today? Victory is always given to God's chosen people today. Those of us who are called, those of us who are chosen, those of us who are faithful, you and I can look forward to victory over and over and over again because we are with the Lord. There's no one who can stand against us. In fact, the Roman writer, I want you to flip over to the book of Romans chapter 8, and the Roman writer expresses this in such a beautiful way. In the book of Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31, the writer states, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Don't you love it? When the Bible asks us a straightforward question, if God is for us, who can stand against us? In other words, if God is on our side, if God is empowering our lives, who can stand against us? And note, if you will, that the Roman writer goes on and answers. He, he gives a several case scenarios. He says in verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? If you and I ever doubt the power that God gives, in, gives to you and me to be victorious in this life, just think of what He's already given. What has God already given you and me? The greatest gift that could ever be known or ever has been known by man. And who is that? That's the Lamb. That's Jesus Christ. He was given to you and me. And the Corinthian writer would speak of this gift as an unspeakable gift. You know, when we get gifts in this life, whether it be a birthday present or a Christmas present or, or a present just because people are being nice, we describe it with words. But when you think about Jesus Christ, you cannot describe that gift because there's never been a gift like Him, nor will there ever be a gift like Him. And when you think of what God has already given us, it should cause us not to doubt with, with a moment or for a moment that God's going to give us everything that we need in order to be victorious. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? That's you and me. It is God who justifies. Oh, there will be people who will come against you and me. But what does it matter? Who is it who justifies us? Who is it who decides if we are right with Him or not? It's God Almighty. He's the one who justifies or makes us righteous. Who is He who condemns? It is Christ who died. 
and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, and watch this, who also makes intercession for us. I mean, we have got the power of God in our lives. If that's not enough, we've got Jesus right now, the Lamb of God, the one who gives us victory, and He is sitting at the right hand of God interceding for us. In other words, when we make mistakes in life, our power doesn't end because when we turn to God and we repent and we walk in the light as He is in the light, and brothers and sisters, that power continues to remain with us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, in all these things, not just these things, but things that are like these things that Paul has noted. We are more, not just victorious. Look at it. See what it says. It doesn't just say that we are victorious. We are more than victorious through Him who loved us. What's the conclusion of the matter, brothers and sisters? If you've got God in your life, Tell me what else you need. What is it? What, what else do we need when God is in our lives? One thing that you can name. Name it. You can. And that's the message that John wants these people to know. And don't you know that was encouraging to them to know that here is Rome and this, this superpower. They've conquered everything. and They're persecuting Christians right and left. And John wants them to know that their time is coming. That their destruction is near. And those who are with God, those who are called, chosen, and faithful, they are going to be victorious. Now, in verse 15, remember, you've got to go back to verse 1. And the angel says, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on the many waters. And verse 15 is that judgment. Look at what he says. And he said to me, or verses 15 and 16, then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, excuse me, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And then verse 16, and the ten horns. Remember the ten horns represent those kings that have joined with Rome. The ten horns which you saw on the beast. And remember back in verse 13, they were of one mind. Remember back in verse 13 that they gave their power and their authority to the beast. What are they going to do in verse 16? They are going to turn on the beast. These will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Did these other nations literally do this? No. Who was it who brought this destruction upon them? It was God. Okay. God brought this destruction upon them. And instead of looking at, okay, these nations came against... This is something that God did, and you're going to see that when we get down into verse 17. But God would cause these individuals to be hated. God would cause these people to be desolate. In other words, empty and barren. And He would cause them to be naked. What, what does the word naked represent? It represents shame and disgrace. When the people were captured, the Babylonians got... God told them that you are going to go away naked. And that's exactly the way they carried them away. They carried them away naked. Eat her flesh. It's something that a savage would do. You think about burning with fire. In the Old Testament, burning with fire was one of the most severe forms of punishment. In other words, judgment is going to be brought upon Rome. Now, remember that I ended class, or we ended class last week, by talking about Rome, Rome is the harlot, in verse 15, who sits over the many waters. In other words, she was ruling. She was reigning. In fact, in verse 18, the Bible says, And the woman you saw that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And so she had this great domineering power. The ability to be able to go in. The ability to be able to conquer the ability to be able to spread the borders of the kingdom, the Roman kingdom. But what was her problem? 
Why is it that these other nations turned on her? Let's read about it in prophecy, okay? Let's go back to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, in verse 40. Clearly, when you read John's description, you can see that the Roman Empire was divided. It was. And even though you've got all of these people, all of these kingdoms joining with her, they were divided. There was the desire for unity, but they didn't have it. And it's very interesting that even the prophets would point out the fact that she would be divided. If you're in the book of Daniel chapter 2, now remember the the image, this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. And beginning in verse 32, the dream was, or the image was, this image head was of fine gold, its chest and arm of silvers, its belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron. Now look at this next part. The feet that was partly partly of iron and partly of clay. Now, when you drop down to verse 37, you can see an explanation of this image. You, O king, talking to Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, the Babylonian kingdom was ruling and reigning at that time, just like Rome is ruling and reigning in the days of John. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory, and wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the earth, the field, the birds of the heaven, he has given them in your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So the head of gold represented the Babylonian Empire. Okay? Verse 39. But after you shall arise another kingdom. That was the Medo-Persian kingdom. And then a third kingdom of bronze. That would have represented the kingdom of Greece. Now in verse 40, you've got a fourth kingdom. Which kingdom is this? It's the Roman Empire that began in 63 63 B.C. and continued unto 476 A.D. But this is the Roman Empire. Now let's slow down and read about the Roman Empire. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Inasmuch as the iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Is that not the description of Rome? Sitting over the many waters, sitting over all the peoples and all the nations, reigning over all the kingdoms, that's the leg of iron. But do you remember the feet? The feet consisted of what? It consisted of iron and clay. Now, if you take iron and clay and mix it together, is it going to be very durable? No. Now you can take a piece of iron and you can just beat on it and beat on it and beat on it. But you take iron and clay that's mixed together and you can hit it one good lick and what's going to happen? It's going to shatter because there's no strength there. There's no pliability. Okay, now, verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom, watch what it says, the kingdom shall be divided. Okay? Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall shall be partly strong and and partly fragile. Now look at verse 43. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men and they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. That represents those kingdoms that came together with Rome, which was a kingdom of iron. But there was no unity there. None whatsoever. And they they came together, and, and look at what's going to happen in verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. You see, that's the way that people looked at Rome. The reason we want to join in with Rome is because she's so great. She's so powerful. She's so majestic. And she's always going to be here. She's never going to be destroyed. 
And God says there's another kingdom that's coming. And this kingdom is never going to be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Now the Roman, the Babylonian Empire, it came, it rose to power. What happened? It fell. The Medo-Persian kingdom, it came, it rose to power. What happened? It fell. Alright? The Greece and King, the, the kingdom of Greece, it came, it rose to power. Tell me what happened. It failed. The Roman kingdom came, it rose to power. What happened to it? It failed. But Daniel says there's coming a kingdom that would be that would be established, it would never be destroyed. Please tell me what that kingdom is. It's what you and I are part of today. It's what existed in this day and age. Brothers and sisters, it was the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this kingdom, the Bible says, would be established and it would never be destroyed. You know, there are so many people who have the idea that the church is in such an awful shape and condition. She's just going to cease to exist. That goes directly against prophecy. It goes directly against the teaching of the Bible. And it limits the great power of God. God established a kingdom that is always going to be here. You want to know why? Because there's always going to be those of us who have been called, who have been chosen, who are faithful, and we seek to keep this kingdom maintained. And as long as we strive to do that, brothers and sisters, she is going to continue to exist. There is no man, nor will there ever come a man or a nation or a kingdom that will destroy the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I've got to believe that. You see, believing that, brothers and sisters, causes us to do what's necessary to make sure that she will continue to exist. Look at the book of Hebrews chapter 12, if you will, with me. Hebrews chapter 12. Go to Hebrews chapter 12, and I want you to look at verse 28. Look at what it says. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, remember the kingdom is the church, right? Daniel says there's a coming kingdom. The Hebrew writer says that we've received it. We're, we're members of it. We're, we're a part of it. John, when the book of Revelation opened, they were members of the kingdom. We're going to see that here in a moment, but what I want you to see is the kingdom cannot be shaken. And the word shaken there literally means it cannot be destroyed. It is an enduring kingdom. Now when John opens up the book of Revelation, note if you will in the book of Revelation chapter 1, that he tells them that he is in this kingdom that Daniel prophesied about, that the Hebrew writer wrote about, that he was a member of. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9 I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos. So John is a member of this kingdom. And Daniel said it would never be destroyed. Now, what was the one thing that was missing from that Roman Empire which brought about her destruction? On the flip side, what is the one thing that caused this kingdom to be established that would never be destroyed? That's the question we want to ask. And I think the answer can be found in the book of Colossians chapter 3. Go there with me. Colossians chapter 3. Look at what the Bible teaches. In the book of Colossians chapter 3, here the Apostle Paul talks about being raised with Christ Jesus. You can see that in verse 1. If, if we've been raised with Christ Jesus, there's a way that we're going to live our lives. There's, there's certain things that we're going to put out of our lives, and there are certain things that we are going to put on. In other words, there are certain things that we are going to clothe ourselves with. And I want you to begin reading with me in verse 12 of Colossians 3. Therefore, as the elect of God, boy, isn't that interesting, you remember that those who are going to be victorious, those who are going to overcome, if you remember the Bible says those who are called and those who are chosen. That word chosen is the same identical word that you see right here with elect. Right? 
God chooses us or elects us when we are obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, therefore, as elect of God, those who have been chosen, those who are holy, those who have been separated from the world, you're living your life according to God's will, and the beloved put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing one another with bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also must you do. Now verse fourteen. But above all these things, but above all these things, put on what? Put on what? Love. Why? Don't miss the next part. Which is the bond of perfection. The word bond there comes from a Greek word which is very similar to what you and I think of as ligaments in the body. Every person here tonight, your, your body consists of bone throughout. I mean, there, there are, I think it's, it's 206 bones throughout. If that's right, if, if it's not, then probably my biology teacher would uh, flash me. But I think there are 206 bones in the human body. What holds them together? Ligaments. If, if you took the ligaments out of your body, then, then you would just fall apart. The ligaments hold those bones together. In other words, the ligaments give unity to your body as a structure. And it's love, according to the Bible that serves as the bond of perfection. What is it that holds us together as the body of Christ? What is it? It's love. What is it that for, for over 2,000 years, the church is still going strong? It's love, is it not? And that's the greatest characteristic that you and I can have in our lives. In fact, if you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the chapter that is described as a, the chapter of love, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, Paul would write and says, Now abide faith, hope, and charity. And you think about those three musketeers right there. Faith. It's the foundation of everything that you and I know. In fact, you can't please God without faith. Hope. It's that element that the, that the Bible describes that anchors our soul, keeps us pressing forward in life. But love, and the greatest of these, is what? It's love. Why? Why would he label love as the greatest? Well, you look at verse 8. Love never what? It never fails. Now, you want to know why there was going to come a kingdom that would be established and it would be an everlasting kingdom? It would be an unshakable kingdom and that no man would ever destroy it? It's because of that characteristic right there. Love holds us together. Love is that element that causes us to be able to overcome any and every problem that we experience in life. Love is that, that element. That's why the Bible says the greatest characteristic that you and I can have in our lives is love. If we want people to know that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ, what do we need in our lives? Love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. Now back to our text. What kept Rome and these other kingdoms from being unified? There was no love. And when there is no love, there will be no unity. And it teaches us the great principle today that if we want unity within the body of Christ, if there is an element that we must be known for, that we must practice, it is the element of love. Now, love does not overlook things in the sense that it just kind of turns a deaf ear and a blind eye. No, love chastens, love corrects, love keeps the commandments of God, right? You know, some people, so many people say, oh, God is love and, and, and He's not going to punish someone who does this or punish someone who doesn't do this. The Bible that teaches us that God is love also says, if you love me, what are we going to do? You know, keep His commandments. And so this idea that God is love and He's not going to punish, the Bible teaches us if we're going to show God that we love Him, 
We've got to do His will. And doing His will means we follow this book above all things. And there's no other book that we're going to follow. And so, when you go back to the text and you, you ask yourself, why could they not unify? What was the ultimate reason for their disaster? And I'm going to suggest to you it was a lack of love. What was it that gave the Lamb and those who were with Him the victory? It was love. It was love that caused Jesus to come and to live and to die and to be resurrected from the grave and to go back to be with the Father and be our intercessor right now. And it's our love for God that causes us to live every day <clears throat> keeping His commandments and doing His will. And so it's the, the characteristic of love. <clears throat> Alright, let's go to the, the next verse. Verse 17, look at what the Bible says. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill His purpose, to be of one mind, to give their kingdom to the beast, until the words of God are fulfilled. You know, a lot of people will look at this verse and they'll say, well, God made them do this. No, God didn't make them do this. But what the Bible is saying is this is part of God's plan. God used these other kings to come in just like He has always used other kings to come in and to help out in the defeat of the Roman Empire. Look, if you will, to the book of uh, Judges chapter 7. Let's go to the book of Judges chapter 7. Go with me to the book of Judges chapter 7. And you, you remember in Judges chapter 7, if you go all the way back to chapter 6, you've got the story of Gideon. Gideon was one of the judges of God. And if you remember in, in Judges chapter 7, that he, or really in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 6, I believe it was, that that he started out with this large sum of men, some 32,000, and then it got down to, I think, 10,000, and it got down to 300 men that's about to go against this enormous army of men. And, and we might ask ourselves the question, how is it that they won the battle? And, and when you drop down to verse 22 of Judges chapter 7, look at what the Bible says. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. Who did this? Get this picture in your mind. Here's Gideon and the 300 men with him, and they're at the top of, of this mountain, and they've all got lanterns and, and the pitcher, and they, they bust the pitcher, and then they blow the, the trumpets, and the people look up and see all of those lanterns and and they hear the sounds of the trumpet and they literally begin to kill one another. That's the teaching of the text there. Who was behind it? It was God. Do we have a problem with this? I don't. Because these were wicked, evil individuals. These were individuals who were against God and His purpose. And therefore God punished them because of it. And in the same way, when you look at Rome, Rome was wicked. Rome was wicked was evil. God had given her opportunity after opportunity to turn and she would not. And so what does he do? He punishes her. And it is at his hand. The same is going to happen in the end time. There are individuals who refuse, absolutely refuse to live their lives by God's standards. And there's going to come a day when every individual, it doesn't matter who that person may be, every individual is going to stand before God. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, for we must all, who does that leave out? Name a person that that leaves out. No one. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one individually, we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether it be good or bad. That's 2 Corinthians 5.10. Romans chapter 14 and verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every person is going to stand before God and answer for the lives that they live. And if they have lived their lives in a wicked way, 
they're going to hear the sad pronouncement, depart from me. I never knew you. Who's going to be behind that? God is. I don't want to be in that line of people. Do you? No. I want to be the people who are called. I want to be the people who are chosen. I want to be the people who are faithful. I want to be the people who are with the Lord so that we can be victorious. And we can do that if we stand with the Lord. Verse 18, And the woman who you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. That's just a conclusion and an explanation of who this individual is. Once again, she has to be none other than Rome. That seems about to be about the only logical and reasonable conclusion that you can make. You can make. Okay, now, the next uh, chapter that we're going to look at, of course, is chapter 18. And chapter 18 is about the fall of Rome. Chapter 17 is the judgment of Rome. Chapter 18, you're going to see a description of the fall of Rome. And there are about uh, five different parts that we're going to look at as we go throughout this chapter. In verses 1 through 3, we're going to look at the announcement of the fall. Verses 4 through 8, you're going to see the command to depart. In verses 9 through 19, you're going to see a lamenting over Rome. Verse 20, a call to rejoice. And then in verses 21 through 24, you've got the final destruction. Let's begin first of all with verses 1 through 3, and let's talk about the announcement of the fall. Verse Chapter 18, verse 1, look at what the Bible says. After these things, in other words, everything that John saw in chapter 17, after these things, I saw another angel, and look at how this angel is described. Coming down from heaven having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his, with his glory. Where was this angel coming from? He had great authority, we can see that. But where did he get his authority? He got it from heaven. And who is in heaven? God is in heaven. And so when you see this judgment right here again, brothers and sisters, it goes right back to what we saw in verse 17. Who is behind this judgment? It is God. Just like in the final judgment. Who is going to be behind that final judgment? We shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That is a passage that the judgment seat literally refers to a seat wherein in the Roman Empire they would literally step up to that judgment seat. And isn't it interesting that that was what took place in the Roman Empire and each one of these individuals are going to stand before a greater judge, none other than Jesus Christ Himself. And they are going to make that journey up those steps to stand before God Almighty and answer for the lives that they live. But this passage opens up with the very fact that everything that you see, once again, it is going directly back to God. God is the one who is in charge of this. He is in control. Look at verse 2. And He cried. <clears throat> the angel cried. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. You know, a lot of times people are going to read this verse and they're, they're going to try to make literal applications and then what they're going to try to do, especially the premillennials, I mean, they are just, they want to take this and they want to make this into some futuristic teaching. Okay, remember, who is Babylon? It's wrong. We, we can see that. Babylon is made mention in chapter 17, Babylon the Great. She is also identified as the great harlot. Okay, she, that great city, this is Rome. Keep that in mind. Let's go back to the book of Isaiah chapter 13. Go to Isaiah chapter 13 with me. And let's read a passage of scripture and see if it does not sound very similar to what we just read. Isaiah chapter 13. <clears throat> and I want you to begin reading with me. Uh, first of all, I want, you to look at, I want you to look at verse 1 so we can know who we are talking about. In verse 1 of Isaiah 13, the burden against who? Who is it? Babylon. Now, 
This is Old Testament Babylon. Remember that, that kingdom that was recognized as the head of gold. The burden against Babylon. Okay, now this is God's proclamation against Babylon. With that thought in mind, drop down to verse 17. Now, before we read verse 17, who came in and overtook the Babylonian kingdom? Well, let's read. Behold, I will stir up, you see it? The Medes against them. That's history, brothers and sisters. It was the Medes and the Persians who came in and overtook the Babylonian kingdom. I will stir up the Medes against them who will not regard silver as for gold and will not delight in it. Also their bows will dash the young men to pieces and they will have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation. Now, now that passage plainly teaches that Babylon would be overthrown, verse 19, just in the same manner as Sodom and Gomorrah was overthrown we know about Sodom and Gomorrah? How was it destroyed? Completely and utterly. Okay? Burnt to a crisp. It will, talking about Babylon, it will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation. Okay? Now, is, is that true? No. Because the very fact that Alexander the Great came in and he made one of his very famous palaces right here in Babylon. Babylon itself does not exist today, but the region wherein it would once stood is very well inhabited. So what, what is Isaiah saying? This is not literal. Remember that Isaiah writes figurative very much. He's trying to get the idea across that Babylon was going to be overthrown to the point of where she would be thought of as never inhabited again. I mean, the idea that he's trying to get them to see, in this era of time, Babylon was looked upon just like Rome. It was the great superpower. To them, it was everything. And when they lost their power and they lost their city, it was as if their entire lives had become desolate. And so the idea here in this passage of Scripture is not a literal, but rather it is a figurative. Power was going to be taken away from Babylon. Likewise, when you go back and you read the very same passage of Scripture, or you read the idea in verse 2, where it says that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that's what we ought to focus in on. Now remember, Rome was thought of as the great power of the world. There is nothing that could be compared to her. Tear up Rome and you've destroyed everything. And therefore that's why he says has become a dwelling place of demons. A prison for every foul spirit. A cage for unclean and hated birds. In other words, she was going to fall. And her fall would be great. And she would never rise to power again. Now, Rome has never risen to power since she fell. Nor will she ever. Look at verse 3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of her of, of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Again, when the Bible speaks of the nations having fornication with her or committing fornication with her, that's not talking about literal fornication, though I'm certain that much fornication took place in the city of Rome. It's simply talking about the fact that these kings joined in with her. What was the purpose of joining in with her? Look at the last part. So that they could become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Remember that Rome was seductive. In other words, she seduced other nations and kingdoms and pulled them in. And the Bible says that she was going to fall even though these others came in and fell with her. Now, if those individuals who joined with her remained there, what was going to happen to those kingdoms also? They were going to fall. If Babylon is falling, it's falling. 
then every kingdom and every person that joined in with Babylon, they too would fall. That's why you've got the plea or the command to depart, beginning in verse 4 and going through verse 8. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her. And here's what we're going to do. Next week I'll be at Maywood Christian Camp. But Lord willing, the following week we will pick up with the call or the command to come out. Why is it that John says to the people, come out from Rome? That's what we want to talk about in our next time together. You've been a great class as you always are. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed teaching the class. There's going to be a short intermission and then there will be some announcements. And then we will have uh, our devotion. Good evening, everyone. It is very good to have everyone here. We're thankful for your presence. We hope that you'll come back every chance that you get. We do have uh, several on our prayer list. Uh, the very top of our prayer list is the, the family of Betty Kendrick. Betty passed away on Tuesday, yesterday. Visitation will be at the Wallace Wilbanks Funeral Home here in Lafayette this Sunday from 3 to 5. There will also be a visitation at the Blessing Church of Christ in Albertville, Alabama, the funeral following. The visitation will be 12 to 1. If you need directions on how to get there, you can see David, and he will, uh, he will help you with that. We also want to remember uh, Rita Jones, Marcia Jeffers, Joni Gary, Lloyd Wright, Patty Cowan, Rachel Reed, Levi Abbott, Lori Barber, Mackenzie Jones, Monique Stevenson, Brooke Wilbanks, Colt Moore, Stella Powell, Shirley Moses, Edna Jones, John Morton, and Yvonne Streeter, who's been diagnosed with kidney cancer. Please keep Yvonne Streeter in your prayers. I do have a card here I would like to read. It says, Thank you so much, church family, for the peace lily, for the cake and visitation at the passing of my mother, Brenda Bullard. She loved all the cards you sent to her. I am privileged to attend such caring and compassionate church. Thanks again. Love, Angela McCauley. Thank you, Angela. We sure do appreciate you. Uh, don't forget, uh, Sylvia Edwards is taking up glasses for the Latin American missionaries. So if you have a, a good pair of glasses that uh, maybe don't fit you anymore, or maybe you just want to get you a new pair, if you'll take those that are in glasses that are in good shape and get them to Sylvia. She will get them into the right hand so that our our mission group, uh, 
that do Latin American missions and take those and give them to people that need them. There will be no Tuesday morning Bible class for July 20th and 27th. Uh, they'll begin again on August 3rd. So if you've got those Tuesdays marked on your calendar like I know you do for the 20th and 27th. Just mark those out and uh, just whet your appetite for an extra good study on August 3rd when we start those back up. Maywood Christian Camps, the 18th to the 24th. So we've got a group going there. So keep that in your prayers. Uh, also, we'll be having a fellowship meal on July 25th and a 2 p.m. service following that. So that's a great, uh, a great thing to be looking forward to as well. Be sure and check the bulletin board for gospel meetings and other events. Always keep an eye on the bulletin as well for a complete listing of the sick. Proper time, our closing prayer will be led by Randy Overby. This time we'll turn the song service over to Joey. One ninety six. One ninety six. Praise the Lord. Good evening to everybody. I'll start this with a couple of questions. How many people know what the show Jeopardy is? Raise your hand. Anyone know Jeopardy? Yeah. How many people has heard of a contestant called Ken Jennings? He's a 74 day champion. And I heard something here a while back that shocked me. They call him the GOAT, which they claim. Is the greatest of all time. And I'm here. Go. Mm -hmm. That sounds familiar to me. What does the Bible say about goats? If you want to, turn to Matthew chapter 25, and that's where we're going to camp out. Matthew chapter 25, starting with verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all His holy angels with Him, then shall He sit on the throne of glory, and before Him be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. He, so, He's going to divide them as a we divide the room down this side, the sheep is on this side, and the goats are on this side. Sorry for your goat for this example. So, they call Ken Jenny to go. Let's see. Let's move down to four, verse 41 and read about goats. 
Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse, into everlasting fire. Hey, wait a minute. I don't sound great to me, does it, y'all? That sounds terrible. Prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me. Not. He started off that verse. I was a stranger, and you took me. You took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when so they had hunger and thirst, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not measure minister unto thee. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, as much as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did not to me. And they shall go away in the everlasting person. That don't sound like the greatest of all time to me. No. But he also mentioned something else. Sheep. And I skipped over that purposely to say the best for last. Starting in verse 32, and he said, and he, I said 32, I'm looking at 33, apologize for that. Yeah, that's right, 33. And he shall sit the sheep on his right hand and go to himself. Then shall the king say and pit them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now that sounds like the greatest of all time to me. To get heaven is your home. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in naked, and you found me, and was sick, and you visited me not, and was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him and say, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and feed thee, and thirsty, and gave thee drink? When shall we thee a stranger, and took in or naked and clothed and when so we sick and in prison and came unto thee and the king shall answer and say unto them verily I say unto you as you have done unto one of these feasts of these my brethren you have done to me so the world says you have to be a goat you are great but really the Bible says if you are a goat you're a loser. It's, to me, I'd rather be a sheep. And I'll skip part of verse 46. While I go, I'll read it in its entirety now. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, the ones on the left, but the righteous into eternal life. Now that sounds like the greatest of all time there, getting eternal life. But you can only do that if you're in the one church. To do that, you already heard the word. You're one step closer. Do you believe with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Pray to repent of your sins and confess his name before this beautiful crowd here and be baptized for, for the remission of sin and then live faithfully until the end of your life, if you've done that and you sin in any way, you have gone to the left side, you're the goat. Whatever you need may do, why don't you come and together we stand and sing.
certainly been great to be here tonight. I want to thank everyone uh, who came out, everyone who participated, those who taught classes, and those who just showed up to enjoy the fellowship that we always get to enjoy here at the Lafayette Church of Christ. We appreciate Brian and his devotion, Joey leading us in those great songs, and I want to encourage you to, to be here Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for Bible class, uh, Sunday morning worship at 11 a.m., and then Sunday evening worship at 5 p.m. Please pray for us as we travel to Maywood Christian Camp. Pray for our safety on the way there, and pray for our safety as we travel back. And don't forget that if you would like to make some desserts uh, that you would like for us to take to Maywood Christian Camp, then you can. if you'll have those here at the building uh, by at least Saturday morning, um, any, any time, just give me a call if you come and the building is unlocked, and or if the building is locked, I'll be more than happy to come over and let you in. You can put those down in the fellowship room, church annex, and then we can take them, and I know that, that the kids would greatly appreciate that. If there's nothing else, we will be dismissed uh, in prayer at this time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the opportunity that you've given us to be here this midday, this Wednesday evening. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for this opportunity and we're thankful for the sunshine you brought us today, the rain and uh, what we've had. Heavenly Father, we know that you know what we need, Heavenly Father. We're just so thankful for the church here, for what it means to this community. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our elders here that lead us and guide us. We just ask that you be with these men, help them. And uh, bless them and give them wisdom to keep on having the truth being taught here. Heavenly Father, we are mindful of our sick. They've been mentioned. I ask that you be with them, help them, and may they uh, get their health back that they truly want, Heavenly Father. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you be with those that have lost loved ones, especially the Kendrick family, Heavenly Father. And just be with them and come to them as long as you can, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we just ask now as we go on through this week that you be with us, keep us safe, and Bring us back to that point in time, Heavenly Father. Give us of our sins. 